So I'm headed to a meeting on the west side of Chicago. It's 70 degrees and sunny in April. I get to where I'm going, and I open this big metal gate, I walk up the stairs, I knock on the door, and then right behind me I hear, oof, oof, oof. And before my conscious mind even knows what's going on, I am out of that yard, I am back on the sidewalk, and I have slammed that big iron gate shut behind me. And I did that because my brain, like yours, is wired to deal with these kind of immediate threats that we've been facing for most of our evolutionary history. Now the threats that we're not so good at are the ones that move in slow motion. And the greatest slow motion threat of all time is climate change. We burn fossil fuels, put greenhouse gases into the air, we're warming our planet, and we're driving ourselves to extinction in slow motion. Now, scientists are very sure about this. 97% of them agree that climate change is happening and that we're the cause. But public opinion is way out of sync with the scientific consensus on climate change. And the reason for that is because we're not as rational as we think. The same mental shortcuts that make us really good at running away from a barking dog can impair our thinking when we're looking at complex long-term issues like climate change. These mental shortcuts are called heuristics or cognitive biases, and there's a whole field of study dedicated to them called behavioral economics. And it turns out that the ways we're irrational are actually pretty predictable, and we've identified them. And these cognitive biases can help us to understand this gap between what scientists know and what we think. One of these is called place attachment. Now there's a little town in northern Michigan called Petoskey that I've been going to every year for my whole life. And I have place attachment here because it's a place that I know, that I love, that I've spent time. And the thing about place attachment is that we don't care so much about places where we haven't been or where we haven't spent a lot of time. So I went to Petoskey a couple of years ago, and I was going down towards the shore at my favorite beach, and I could feel that warm sand between my toes, and I could see the sun shining off the water, and I could smell that fishy, freshwater smell of Lake Michigan. And as I got down closer to the shore, I realized that the water level was about five feet lower than I was used to. And I found out that this was because of climate disruption. And I've spent a lot of time thinking and reading and learning about climate change, but never had it hit me so viscerally as it did, as it did in that moment. It didn't feel that way when somebody told me that there was a glacier melting on the other side of the world. That's place attachment. Now, we also care a lot more about what's happening right now in the present, and we're not so good at thinking about how those things are going to play out in the far future. This is called hyperbolic discounting. Now, classical economics tells us that we're very rational about making trade-offs between our wants in the present and how those are going to affect our desires in the future, right? But anybody who's ever tried to save for retirement or go on a diet or get an impulsive face tattoo knows <laughs> what hyperbolic discounting is like. Now, we also... Uh, uh, we also tend to worry more about things that are immediately accessible to us, right? This is called the availability heuristic, and it's related to hyperbolic discounting and place attachment. And so an idea that's at the top of our mind, that's easily accessed mentally, we worry more about it than something that maybe isn't so close to the front of our mind. So my mom is an accomplished, brilliant woman, but she's afraid of flying. And when I bug her about this, she'll always tell me, listen, I know intellectually that there's more car crashes. I know that more people die in them. I know that I'm more likely to be in them, but I'm still afraid of flying. And the reason for that is the availability heuristic. We're exposed to so many terrifying images and terrifying ideas about plane crashes that even though the risk is very small, we perceive it to be very large. Now, speaking of my mom, we also care a lot more about the people that are close to us and that we know than people that are far away and that we don't. There's actually a cognitive limit on the number of people that we can not just be friends with, but really recognize fully as human beings. And this number is about 150. So your 1,000 Facebook friends are a lie. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, this 150 number is nicknamed the monkey sphere because of the early experiments they did on monkeys to identify this number. Uh, and we see this 150 number come up over and over again. Our ancestors lived in groups of about 150. And still today, military companies are about 150 people in size, because when you get above that, you lose the camaraderie and the unit cohesion that's so important. 
right? So the monkey sphere is the reason why it seems more upsetting to you when your roommate breaks up with her boyfriend than when a thousand people die halfway across the world because your roommate's in your monkey sphere and they're not. So taking all these things together, we care a lot about things that are happening right now to people we know in places we're familiar with. And by the way, climate change is. But most Americans think that climate change is happening in the far future, somewhere else, to people we don't know. And so in light of these cognitive biases, it's not too surprising that we don't care about it. Now, if it were just our preoccupation with the here and now that we had to worry about, we could probably get around that, right? We could talk less about polar bears, which are far away and which we don't know, or at least most of us don't. And we could talk more about the impacts of climate change here and now that we see every day, right? The droughts, the floods, the fires. But there's another more complicated level of cognitive bias under this. And that is that we really like ideas that reinforce our view of the world. And this makes sense, right? These ideas, these shared values have historically been important to us because we live in these tight-knit social groups. And those shared ideas and values serve as a kind of social glue. And we still exist in these tight-knit social groups and depend on these common ideas to tie us together. And they're so important to us that we're, when we're confronted with ideas that confront our worldview, that conflict with it, we tend to reject them. This is called cultural cognition, and I've been running a kind of a natural experiment on cultural cognition for years. So I did my undergrad at Michigan State University, and some of my friends went to our rival school at the University of Michigan. And when we get together, I like to tell them that we have a better football team. We've won six of the last seven games against the University of Michigan. But no matter how strong the evidence is on my side, six or seven games, they will never agree with me that we have the better football team. But you know, in the seven years before that, they beat us six times, and I never admitted to them that their team was better. And that is cultural cognition in action. The idea that our team is better is so firmly rooted in our identity and in our view of the world that even in the face of this overwhelming evidence, we can't admit that the other team is better. Now you'd think if the evidence was as overwhelming as it is with climate change, right? If Michigan State had won 97 out of 100 games against the University of Michigan, surely they would have to admit then that we were better, right? Well, this is kind of the conventional theory about persuading people on the issue of climate change, that they just don't really know the science, and if we could convince them of the science and show them about the 97% consensus that scientists have, they would have to agree that it's happening and they would come on board, right? Now, if this was happening, you would think that people who didn't know very much about science wouldn't care very much about climate change, right? And people who knew a lot about science and who understood this threat, they would care. But it turns out that this is only true for about half of people. People with a communitarian worldview who think that we're more or less all in this together. Uh, you may have guessed these people tend to be liberal. The other half of people who have a more uh, individualistic worldview, they tend to be conservative, uh, these people, as they learn more about science, they actually care less about climate change. And they found that this is basically because they use this scientific knowledge as sort of a bludgeon to beat back this idea of climate change that conflicts with their worldview. And it turns out uh, that even though we think the mind operates more like a scientist in rational pursuit of objective truth, when we're, when we're confronted with an idea that conflicts with our view of the world, our brain actually behaves more like a lawyer. It has an agenda, and it tries to undermine the arguments of this idea that's threatening to infringe on our view of the world. Uh, and this is called motivated reasoning, right? And so this motivated reasoning is why we found that the best predictor of what you think about climate change is not how much you know about science, it's your worldview, and it's your ideology. Now, uh, this is a problem for conservatives uh, and people with an individualistic worldview because they tend to think that unfettered markets are the best thing for society, generally speaking. And the problem comes in because climate change is the greatest market failure of all time. When we burn fossil fuels, uh, it creates what are called negative externalities, right? These are harms caused by an activity to other people but that we don't really pay for. So when I burn fossil fuels, it causes asthma it causes heart disease, and it causes climate change. 
And because this isn't priced into the market value, I'm going to do a lot, of a lot more of this than I would otherwise if I had to pay for those things, right? And when everybody's doing this together, it causes a market failure that we call the tragedy of the commons, where everybody acting individualistically in their own self-interest results in an outcome that's bad for everyone. So imagine if everybody in this room were all fishing out of one pond, and we've set how many fish we're supposed to catch so that we can keep the fish stocks healthy for everybody. But I realize I can make a little more money if I catch more fish than I'm supposed to. And then you realize that you can make a little more money if you do the same thing, and you do, and you do too, and you do too, and then all of a sudden we're out of fish. It's the same thing with climate change. I want some cheap energy, don't think too much about the side effects, and you do, and you do, and you do, and then the climate is changing. Right? And there's a solution to this. That's the good news. We can act collectively to price carbon or to put caps on it. And we can address this market failure. And for someone with a communalistic worldview or a more liberal perspective, this is right in line with what they think about the world. Because they already believe we should be cooperating economically. They're skeptical of businesses. And they're very willing to regulate them. Right? But if you lean more conservative and you're of the view, like Ronald Reagan, that collectivism stifles all the, best in, uh, all the best characteristics of mankind, then this idea that we need to act collectively to solve this problem is abhorrent to your worldview. And the little lawyer in your brain is up in arms about this. Right? And, and so the reason this is a problem for us is because those policies that we need to pass to correct this market failure, those take political will. And when a big chunk of your electorate doesn't acknowledge this as a problem, or perhaps one of your major political parties doesn't recognize this as a problem, it's very hard to pass those policies that are going to help us stave off this slow motion extinction. And the way that we can deal with that is we need to create a popular, broad-based movement that includes liberals and conservatives. That's the only way we're going to break through this political gridlock. And if we're going to do that, Climate advocates are going to have to learn how to talk to people who see the world a little differently than we do. Because see, we're susceptible to those irrational biases too. We like ideas that appeal to our worldview too. And for a long time, we've been talking about climate change in terms that mostly appeal to liberals. We say let's uh, help the least fortunate. Uh, we say that let's all work together for uh, a better future. And this framing, even though people might agree with this idea, this framing is really directed at liberals and speaks to their worldview. Uh, and it's worked, right? Uh, overwhelmingly, public opinion, liberals, they agree with climate change that it's happening, and uh, they want to stop it. And that's great. But if we want to create this broad-based movement that we need, if we want to do more than just preach to the choir, we have to learn, as climate advocates, to speak to people who see the world differently than we do. Right? And the good news is, is that climate change is a big, complex issue, and there's a lot of moral lenses that we can look at it through. It could be an opportunity for America to once again help rally the world against an existential threat, right? like we did in World War II. Or it could be an opportunity to follow God's commandment that we be stewards of the earth. Or it could be an opportunity to free ourselves from these old, dirty fossil fuels and put human ingenuity to work on an energy revolution. If we want to convince people on this issue, we have to talk to them in terms of the way they see the world, not we do, not how we do. And that'll help quiet down those lawyers in our brains that don't like new ideas. Now, another way to do this is when we hear this message from people that we know and we trust. A conversation that you have with a friend or a family member is going to be much more powerful than any speech that a politician can give, right? And we saw this in 2011 when a conservative Republican congressman from South Carolina named Bob Inglis reversed his lifelong position that climate change wasn't happening. He came out, he said it was a big problem, and we needed to act on it. And what made this shocking transformation happen in Bob Inglis wasn't a call from a high-powered lobbyist or a donor. It wasn't a climate scientist. It was his children. So we've seen how our, this old wiring in our brain can make us irrational, can make us biased, and can make us stubborn. But in this old wiring may also lie our salvation. Because we're wired to trust each other, like we saw with Bob Inglis, how his children could get through to him. And we're also wired for stories. I'll bet most of the people in this room will remember my story about getting chased by a dog or about going to the beach in Petoskey long after you've forgotten what hyperbolic discounting means if you haven't already. And that's because 
We're wired and we've been using language for as long as we've had it to, to communicate through stories, our ideas, our identities, and our values. We're wired for stories literally. When a storyteller tells a story to an audience, both of them actually experience the things that are being described in the story. Their minds sync up. And this creates the kind of empathy and the kind of trust that we need to accept and embrace new ideas without batting them away because they conflict with our worldview. And so let me tell you my story. My family is from coal country in Appalachia. And I grew up on stories from my dad hearing about members of my family that worked in the coal mines and that were exposed to toxic chemicals and who got sick and who died. And then a couple of years ago, I heard that my cousin Matt had gone back to West Virginia. And on those same hills where our family used to mine coal, he was building windmills. And those windmills, of course, mean a little bit of a cleaner climate in the future, but they also mean the beginning of something for that community. It means that maybe the next generation won't have to hear the stories that I did. Maybe they won't have to go in the mines. Maybe they won't have to get sick. And that's my story, but everybody watching, if you think about it, has a story about how climate change has affected them. And everybody has a friend or a family member that will listen to that story, right? And so if you take one thing away from this talk today, let it be this. Think about one person in your life who isn't yet on board with this movement to stop our slow motion extinction, who isn't yet concerned about this pressing issue of climate change. Think about the way they see the world, sit down with them and tell them a story about why you care about climate change and about why they should too. Because even though this old wiring with these ancient uh, evolutionary roots in our brains can make us biased, can make us fearful, can make us stubborn, we're also wired to trust each other. And we're also wired to connect through stories. And if we all leverage that power of trust and of storytelling, we can create the popular movement we need to stop climate change. Thank you. <laughs>